Well, greetings again. This is H.D. Uh, McCarty, your old uh, Razorback rabbi is what I tell everyone. For about 30 years, I had the joy of being the chaplain to the Arkansas Razorback, and uh, it was a great run. So rabbi really means exalted teacher. I don't think many of the players knew that, or they might not have called me the rabbi. But I'm going to give you a rabbi insight today that I hope will change your life. I have a little blurb I've done on the mind of Christ. My life verse is Philippians 2.5. Let this same mind that was in Jesus Christ be in you. And I recognize it. I've just been a Christian 18 months. I've been a Christian over 65 years now. And that verse has motivated my life. And I've tried to model everything I've thought around him. I've failed so many times. I don't know why the Lord's put up with me. But he has. He loves me and knew that when he saved me. So I'm still pursuing the mind of Christ. Now one of the second greatest verses, I guess, about the mind of Christ is in Romans chapter 12, where Paul says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of everything God has done for you, his mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing. Holy literally means separated to truth. You don't put on a big robe and take a, a bath and put a halo around your head. Holiness means separation to truth. Pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Don't conform anymore to the pattern of this world, its rituals, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now the word renew, we've talked about that before in the Hebrew, in the uh, Old Testament, and the New, means really to exchange. Over in uh, uh, Isaiah 40, 31, it says, They that wait, uh, really expect anything from the Lord, uh, will renew their mind. And the Hebrew there can mean exchange their mind. So the answer to life, if you want power and strength and wisdom and truth, is to exchange your mind, my mind, for Christ's mind. And here's what it says to do. That's the point of everything. Now, I have a little paper I've written, and of course it's available. I'm just going to go over it very, very briefly now, talking about the mind of Christ. And I say there are about eight steps to the mind of Christ. Eight things that need to take place we need to think about if we're going to master and move our life to the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what I want to do is share those with you very quickly. And uh, there's a lot. I could talk 30 minutes or 45 minutes on each one of them, but I'm just going to go through them quickly and then emphasize a little bit on number one. <clears throat> the first thing we need to know and to understand if we're going to think like the Lord Jesus Christ, which is so important, to understand the Lamb of God is our salva as our salvation. That we see the Lamb, we've asked Christ into our life, we love Him, He's forgiven our sin. I remember, remember when I became a Christian, <clears throat> uh, my, the man that led me to Christ asked me, he said, are you a Christian? I said, well, yeah. And he said, well, what is a Christian in your mind? I said, well, I guess someone who lives in America, believes in God, doesn't kick old ladies. <laughs> now, that really was what I told him. I'm not making that up. And I was a senior in high school, but had no insight, never read the Bible at all. But he said, no, a Christian is one who's in right relationship with Jesus Christ uh, through what he has done for us. And you simply ask him to come into your life, and he'll do it. And I remember that, uh, that moment. I knew I was a sinner. I knew I'd blown it. I knew I needed help. I knew my life was empty. I wanted something real, and I did everything I could. I loved music. Music was my idol. And I was a jazz drummer in a jazz band. We played all over Dallas. And man, I studied professionally. And so music was really my idol or my god and a few other things I shouldn't have been doing. So I knew I needed to be cleaned up and find some kind of purpose. And Bird told me, the man that led me to Christ, all you have to tell the Lord is that 
Father, I don't understand it all, but I know I need you. I need more than what I am. And the best I understand, I ask you to come into my life, uh, save me from what I am, uh, make me a, a new person, and I'll seek to follow you as my Lord as long as I live. And he told me, H.D., if you'll say something like that, I promise you that the Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, will come into your life right now. Well, good night, that was too much to pass up, I guess. I believed it. I, I felt a prompting to do it. I didn't know the Lord was working on me. And right there in that little old street off of uh, SMU, really, is where we lived then, I asked Jesus Christ to come into my life and began my journey of knowing what the Lamb, the Lamb of God was. Remember what uh, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away, lifts off the sin of the world. And man, I needed some of the junk lifted off me, just like all of us do. Now once I really accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and knew what the Lamb was, I began to understand the cross. Now man, I tell you, you know, I thought, hey, I'm a Christian now and everything's fine. I don't need to worry about anything anymore. I'll be a happy cat. The rest of my life, I don't have any problems. That's what a lot of us think. But we don't realize, really, what's ahead of us. You see, if it took a cross of Christ to solve the world's problems, we're not going to jump that step. Over in Isaiah 53, is an amazing verse, it's uh, talking about the Father, and said, It pleased the Father to bruise the Son and bring him to grief. Now, if you and I are really going to learn what this world's all about and why we desperately need salvation and the power of God into our life, we need to be driven there by the cross. I've been a military man, was uh, retired now after 33 years. I've been a student of history. And there is no evidence anywhere that the hell, the murder, the rape, the injustice, the terror that have gone on for the last 4,000 years are going to stop anytime soon. There is an evil in the world that has to be dealt with. And uh, the scriptures tell us that evil is dealt with by the cross, the cross of Jesus Christ. And for us to understand the meaning of that and uh, really use it as Christ used his cross, we have to have our own cross. So that's the second thing. You have to be a cross thinker if you're going to take the next step in, uh, in following him. Well, the third thing is to become what I call a triune thinker. And uh, this is very important. You can't even think well or right unless you think in threes. Now, very simply, I get that from the idea that we have a triune God. There was a, in the book of Genesis, it said, come let us make man in our image. That means more than two or one. That means at least two. And then if you read the rest of the New Old Testament and the New especially, you see there are three people who make up one person of the Godhead. Now, I'm not going to try to talk about that now. It's too much for any man or woman's mind. But Jesus himself said it when he sent his people into the world. He said, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And each of them has a, a beautiful uh, relationship to us. One of the brief ways I use it is that, well, the Father was a creator the Son is our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit is our Perfector. Boy, that's great to know. There's a triunity for you. And all through the Scripture, you see triunities everywhere. In fact, Paul said, remember, there, be, there abide of three things, faith, love, and hope. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? There were three people at the crucifixion. You know, that's interesting how God... Uh, does that three. In fact, there's one author, he wrote a book called All the Threes of the Bible, but we don't have time for it now, other than to think, say, we need to think triunally. Now, what do I mean about that? Well, let me draw you a, a quick little diagram here uh, using uh, a triangle, which is 
symbolic of the three. In my book, I use this all the time. And there are three things we need to think about all the time. First of all, there's the self. What am I going to do with who I am? Thirdly, there are issues. What are you going to do right now? What are you going to have for dinner? How are you going to pay the bills this week? Uh, how are you going to get promoted in work? How are you going to finish that assignment? What do you want to do about this problem? All of us don't have any problem knowing that I have a self and I have issues. And unfortunately, that's as far as some people go. Their whole life is what I call dualistic. Reality is just two things, me and the world. But if that's all you have, you're in, I think, big trouble because there's more there than you and the world. Because some people use the world and get by with kind of a happy life, but most people get beat up by the world and don't know how to handle it. So for Christians who are not dualists, we're Trinitarian. Uh, we believe there's a third element, and what that third element is, is truth. We have to bring truth into our life if it's going to be what God created us to be. And so you take those three things, and what you do, you join them together. I'm going to take my honest self, the truth from God that I can believe it, and the issue as it is, and create, here we go, what I call a Christ nuclear thought. I'm going to think about myself and this issue, what Christ would think about it. I'm going to have his mind about what's going on, which gets back to my life verse in Philippians chapter 2, let the same mind be in you, which was also in Jesus Christ. So we find the mind of God by being honest about what we are and what we need and what we've done, by the issue as best we understand it, we need to grow and learn issues better, and third, the truth as it comes from the Father. And we create these Christ nuclear thoughts which gives you the wisdom to act. That's what a triune thinker is. Now fourth, once you become a triune thinker, you will be gonna quadrate everything you come into in life. You say, oh, good night. Now, what does quadrate mean? Well, I'm going to do this real slow. I'm going to just do a little box here. And here you are, right in the middle of it. Now, you'll notice where three is the number of revelation from God. Four is the number of application by man and by woman. Everything facing you right now has a fourfold dimension. Isn't that amazing? Just like there's north, east, south, and west. It says in the scriptures that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and favor with man is a fourfold thing. There are four parts to the day. There's night and day and dawn and twilight. Isn't that interesting? Paul said to the Ephesians, I think it was, Oh, I pray you'll know the width, the height, the depth, the length of the love of God. Everywhere you go, man's number is four. Romans 11:32 says that God has locked us all up in the prison house of disobedience so that he can have mercy on us. And so what we have to do is realize that four pressures are always moving in on us. If you're in a family situation, you think about how should you act, what does your wife think, what should the child do, and what does God want? Four good issues. If you're the president of a company, you think about what the customer wants, what your employees are doing, and what's true, what's right. On and on, I have you know several pages where I make that point. But once we know that we need to quadrate, we take each one of those little parts and try unitize them. Isn't that interesting? And we get a Christ nuclear thought about each situation. The one of my favorites, and I probably shouldn't take time for this, we'll have to do it later, is politics. Well, this is a big time for politics. There are just four positions you can take in politics. 
You can either be a liberal, you can be conservative, you can be radical, or you can be passive. The liberal many times is kind of a naive optimist. The conservative is sort of a, that's how I see it, a realistic cynic. cynic. You know, uh, this is real, but I'm cynical about it. A uh, zealot or radical, there's just one issue that matters. You know how that goes. And then for the passive, they're the know-it-all, do-nothing. You know, oh yeah, they know the answer, they're not going to do anything about it. So really all four positions are held by the whole world. What have I left out? Nothing. All four are there. And the great thing was about Jesus, he knew how to be at the pinnacle right here. We'll get that in a minute, how to have the God thought about it. He was a liberal when he healed him on the Sabbath. You know, oh, you don't do that. He was conservative when he healed the lepers and sent them to the priest. He was a radical when he kicked them out of the temple. Good night. And he was passive when he let the fools crucify him. You can't get any more passive than that, especially when he, as God, could have wiped them all out and had 12 legions of angels come to protect him. Well, this is a great deal here, the quadrate, how important that is. And we have four more, but I think I'll save those till next time. Uh, we've probably tried to cover too much, but there are four more steps once we have accepted Jesus as our Savior, learn what it is to take up the cross, which is critical. Begin to be a triune thinker. Think the way Jesus thought. He was a triune thinker. He says, I only do, that's, uh, that's the self, what the Father, that's the truth, tells me to do about the issue. And he said that again and again. And then quadrate, that's the way he faced the world. What should he do? So anyway, the Lord bless you with that thought and these first four steps. And hopefully you'll catch my next four because I'll do them next. God bless you and keep thinking.